I'm Beth Fisher. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in digital humanities at the Williams College Museum of Art. And today I'm talking a little bit about our efforts to take away some of the technical, mental, and logistical barriers for students and faculty using uh, museum data and particularly art museum data. We're a teaching art museum in Western Massachusetts at a very small liberal arts college. Uh, the mission of the museum includes using objects without trying to push them into art history. We keep the class objectives as the priority and don't try and expand them to make them about art or about even about history in general. And on the screen, you can see a couple of the classes from recent semesters, a Russian class and a geosciences class. Our goal is to use data and digital projects as one more piece of the work that we're already doing regularly. So just like we don't use our art collection only for teaching about art and cultural topics, we didn't want to use our data only for something like an art class or a computer science class or a digital humanities class. The vast majority of the classes we work with have very little experience with art history, museum studies, or digital projects. And usually these are not their goals anyway. We also want to make it easier for the general public to work with our collection in all ways the images, the objects, the data, and the museum history. So who do I mean by we here? Um, Chad Weinard is our digital projects manager, and he sort of coordinates and directs everything and does an awful lot of groundwork as well. Rachel is our registrar. Um, she handles most of the initial data management, especially thinking about how content gets into our systems in the first place and questions about the catalog database. Uh, Jim is a developer that we work with who does a lot of the work to get our systems working together and also making sure that we're working within college requirements and college limitations. Liz is our academics program curator and she's very much on the education side, working with how faculty on how to use our collections generally. Um, I'm kind of the bridge person here. Uh, I'm primarily a medieval art historian and my role with this is to identify needs on the instructional side and then help develop the tools, methods, and approaches that we can use to meet those needs, and then help faculty and staff actually use those tools. So I focus really on bite-sized tools and approaches for use by classes that aren't directly about programming or data science. Uh, one of our biggest goals here is to make it easy to work with the parts of the collection that aren't on display, everything in our set, and to provide resources that help create new narratives out of our collection. We have over 15,000 objects, but only 200 or so can be on display at once. So that's about 1% of the collection, a little over 1%. The graphic that I'm showing on the screen now is a Tableau visualization showing how often our records say that each object in the collection has been on display. Um, each of the objects is represented by a small rectangle and the lighter the rectangle, the less the object has been used. Um, so those darker blue looking ones have been, been on display quite frequently, um, but you'll see that almost 70% of our collection is not recorded as ever having been on display. The objects are organized on the screen by regions and by type of work. So paintings are actually the most common type to put on display, and I think this is true at many museums. Um, even though they're actually a fairly small uh, proportion of our collection in comparison to things like prints and photographs and other types of work, works on paper, decorative arts and other objects. The ones that are on display are also quite disproportionately European and American objects. Uh, this is obviously very limiting from many standpoints. We end up prioritizing certain objects for teaching in part because they are on display um, and that also reinforces the narratives that we ourselves have created. We're working hard to get more works on display and to create new stories about them, but this project problem really will never be solved. We can't have a big enough space and we're always going to be part of the system. So primary goal as we're teaching with data is that we wanna enable people to work with this collection, all that stuff that can't be out regularly or ever, and we wanna encourage work by people who are not us and are not like us. We also feel that the collection as a whole is an important piece of evidence about art, about the history of the college and the history of collecting in the US more generally, and so we want to acknowledge that as well. Um, we want to learn from people who know more about certain parts of this work than we do and to make it easy for them to contribute. Um, so we want to make it possible for people to create actively, not just contributing to our collection or creating new exhibitions, but finding other kinds of things that they can do that we can't even imagine. So flexible tools are part of it. So in terms of how we actually do that, um, a big part of that is how we create access for the data itself and then how we uh, can approach that data in classes. I have here um, a diagram that I'll explain a little bit in a moment. 
but the key parts here, providing access to our data starts with getting content out of a proprietary limited access database on, on the screen. Um, our database is there on the left with that giant orange G that stands for gallery systems, the makers of TMS, which is one of the standard museum databases. This database feeds information, especially our images into eMuseum, um, which is a public facing side of that TMS database. Um, and there are some changes coming to TMS that should make it more user friendly, but we can't afford that yet. Uh, that content that I'm talking about on eMuseum is typically accessed through our website. Uh, that's pretty limited. It can be searched and browsed, but it's not very flexible and it's really hard to get information out of a system like that, especially if you're working with groups of objects. We also want people to be able to work with things that they wouldn't think to search or browse for. A lot of our information has very little metadata associated with it because we just don't know that much. So how do you make it possible for someone to search for that? Um, so starting with this idea of how do we give access to the whole collection, we start with methods that are really familiar to anyone who's worked with open data at cultural institutions. For the metadata, we use um, a SQL uh, process to export JSON files and make those available on GitHub. Um, a Python script also generates a CSV from that. I'll talk about that a little later. Both the images and the metadata can also be accessed through customized calls made by the API. Um, so like I said, these are pretty, pretty typical approaches for museums that are opening up their data and collections, and classes did use this some. So a digital humanities class at UCLA used it, and computer science classes at Williams have used a lot of this kind of information through the API. A lot of math and science courses have been particularly interested in our data set because it's relatively small compared to a lot of the data sets they're using. Um, it's human readable, so if you actually look at the data, you can tell what it's talking about but also because it's messy and incomplete. So those very things that we think of as a problem about our data are very engaging to a lot of um, classes coming out of the math and science side of things. That's great for teaching students about things like what happens when multiple people are entering data, especially if they're doing it over a period of say 200 years, as is the case in our data, um, or if you get false results from missing content, um, responses in situations that aren't easy to categorize, changing terminology, all things that we don't want to clean out of our data because it's an important part of our institutional history. So classes like those, the ones that are using this data set as a data project, often come into the museum to help students connect the data they're interacting with to real works of art and real people. Um, we also work on topics like that in the gallery um, for student and general public audiences. I'm showing here pictures from an exhibition called Pink Art um, that we had in 2017 where computer science students crowdsourced ideas of pink online, then wrote a series of algorithms trying to identify which works in the collection counted as the most pink. The table at the bottom center shows the variation in how individual objects were related, were rated by the different algorithms. So this project was an effort to think about how human created concepts, like the boundaries of the category pink, affect the creation of supposedly objective computer projects. Um, and you can see that there on the bottom left how we, uh, we displayed that in the gallery explaining how the data worked with that. But this is a terrible example of how to teach new people how to work with data. And it's not a particularly good way to explore some of the main considerations we have in our collection about artists, objects, and institutional history. So I want to show a different kind of data-driven exhibition, one that we might scarcely think of as data science because the process is so easy and familiar. This is accession number, a show that took works that had entered the museum collection between 1960 and 1962 and just hung them in chronological order. Missing or deaccession works were represented by those empty black framed boxes that you see sort of toward the top left on that angled wall there. This show was intended to highlight our museum history. By sorting by the year works entered the collection rather than by the year of creation, or another factor of content or artistic significance, we could use the collection to ask students and other visitors to explore the role of institutional history in the production of, it, of knowledge. Unlike pink art, in which students used complex programming techniques to produce an exhibition about data, accession number, which was mostly created by a graduate student, used the kind of data manipulation that we all do to provoke questions that forced institutional reflection and broader ideas about art and history. Our API and the GitHub content were great for supporting the kind of teaching that produced pink art, but not so good for encouraging the kind of exploration and introspection of accession number. 
data was available, but not really what we might think of as accessible. You have to be able to code and you need somebody who has already has some idea of what's there to create a good project. So I've started using a different idea of what it means for our museum data to be open and accessible. First, it shouldn't require programming for the user to see data content and its structure. It should be really easy to bring it into other low barrier programs, the kinds of programs that many students are already using so they don't have to learn a new program to get started. So things like Excel or programs that produce really quick, immediate results like Voyant. No outside approval or login should be required to get access ideally. You should just be able to play around on a whim um, on weekends or perhaps when your institution is closed because of um, an international emergency. We consider ourselves caretakers of this data, not guards of it. So we need to make sure that we're, we're putting that into practice. Um, I'll add that something that we're very lucky to have is that we own most of our image rights in this particular case. So that does make it a lot easier for us for, for the images themselves. So we had a CSV file, file on GitHub. I've highlighted it here in red. Um, and GitHub didn't require a login. You could just open a CSV file in a spreadsheet program like Google Sheets or Excel and see it in a clear textual structure. So it's meeting some of those requirements. But even that, however, still required someone to download the file. And even students who are familiar with Excel and the idea of structured data and tables haven't always heard of things like CSV. So they don't necessarily recognize that, that, that format is what that format is, even if they're familiar with what it looks like when you open it. Um, and more importantly, GitHub has the look and feel of kind of a techie person site. It looks like a place for coders. It doesn't look like a place for, for normal everyday people. Um, and even putting a welcoming readme on the top level page doesn't take away that sense. I found that students and faculty see this kind of a site and they assume that they'll break some things. So they're very reluctant to click around and explore it. So it didn't encourage a kind of barrier-free data exploration and messiness that we really wanted to get. It came down to this idea that however accessible our data actually was, um, our data and images didn't feel accessible. Those of us who work in museums are familiar with this issue where people think the museum isn't for them and you can't even get them in the door. And if you're working in a classroom, you might be familiar with this when you just can't get students to show up at your office hours, things like that. So we needed to get them through sort of this virtual door. So last August, we made the data available as a Google Sheet, and I'm showing you a picture of that here. Um, why Google Sheets? First, we could easily make the document public so that people could see it without downloading anything or even making an account. People could sort, filter, copy, all of that kind of stuff, and they could easily make a copy of it for themselves if they wanted to play around and not worry all about breaking things. And we actually included information on how to do that uh, in the document itself. Second, a lot of colleges, including ours, are already using Google Sheets. So students and faculty don't need to make accounts in a new tool, even if they want to have a personalized copy. We could encourage them to start working with data in this very, very familiar format and familiar environment. They could start doing things like searching for terms, sorting by those accession dates that were so popular um, with the exhibition. And they could also start seeing the huge gaps in, in our data. Um, for example, a lot of students assume that a, that a field like culture or period will be a very useful one for projects. But if you actually look at what's in our data, those fields are rarely used. And this is just a historical part of how, how the institution has worked and, and it, to some degree how things come over from that TMS database. So this makes it students can tell what they should be getting as results when they do start using it for more complicated projects. This was a really quick process, actually. We are already pushing data to GitHub as a CSV. So we put a script in a Google Sheet that pulls the CSV content from GitHub and puts it in the sheet automatically. That script runs every night. So that sheet always reflects the latest data. Now, that's not a big deal for our collection um, because that doesn't change that often. Um, but it, as we're starting to share things like our exhibition content and the events that happen at the museum, that's a bigger deal. This has only been around for a semester now, and we didn't add it till pretty late, um, but we're still seeing some traction. In particular, we've seen a lot of interest in issues like how descriptions of work change over time. And I'll show an example of that project in a minute or two. Um, and something that's gotten a lot of interest was when female donors start being identified at, by their own names and not as Mrs. Male Donor. Um, we've seen a lot of interest in how making the data available encourages asking questions frequently ones we don't know the answer to and prompting exploration. So using this not as a source for other projects, but, but sort of a playing area. 
This initial phase, getting comfortable with what's in the data without needing to use any digital tools, helps give students the motivation to start testing their theories. And that's when I start suggesting tools that are driven by that initial playtime. In class sessions, we start with basic tools that are built into sheets and other spreadsheet software. Basic functions like filtering and advanced sorting and making simple charts and graphs. We've also learned that there are many classes that want to use Tableau for data analysis and visualization. And, and you can see some examples of that here. Several of us on the team have created interactive Tableau visualizations with our data that we use in tech teaching, encouraging students to explore content for fun. Again, with the idea with that is not to create something necessarily meaningful in itself, but to provoke questions. So here is, a, is something that's sort of really terrible from a data analysis point of view. We have average area of, of the dimensions of our artworks um, over their creation date, right? What's, you know, what kind of things might that actually tell you? I don't know, but students love playing around with stuff and they start going, hey, that looks strange. Why is that? And they think of questions from that. Because Google Sheets can be connected directly to Tableau, students can work with the live data without uploading anything separate. So we've already made that connection for them. Um, and if something is, is added to our data, that live link between Tableau and Google Sheets means that their, their visualizations update automatically. I've also started to work with uh, faculty on using our data for other types of content exploration. For example, a recent class uh, over our January term the students use fields from the data set as a text corpus and buoyant, um, which you can see here. They did things like compare the description terms from earlier periods, um, earlier accession dates with later accession date periods to see whether there are changes in how we described our collections over time. They also looked at the terms used most frequently to describe objects from different parts of the world. And we had several students who started in buoyant and ended up deciding to go into more complex text analysis software. So again, this idea that you get them playing in one area and then they, they self-prompt into something else. So to sum up that part, we're trying to create comfort with the data before they need anything technological um, and using that to drive questions. This is our current image setup and we're not happy with this. This is um, you download a zipped file with all the images, but it does let you work with the entire collection at once and that is feasible for most people. It's about three gigabytes total. Um, these are primarily being used for computer vision and machine learning projects, but we do like to use them for things like exploration and image prompts, and this can help students become more adventurous. So what's next? Um, first, working on that image problem, a generous interface image browser, no download required, multiple ways to explore and sort in the browser. We're also working really hard on how to handle biographical and geographical data. Recent efforts in our galleries have tried to add where artists traveled, studied, and lived, not just their birth nationalities. And we're trying to figure out how to best to put that in our structured data. Um, we're also thinking of the same questions about location. We're trying to find ways to review and integrate student content or outside content. In the and right now we're working on remote teaching. So finally, this is all driven by the idea that our data is as much a part of our collection as the artworks themselves. Data and data analysis are not just internal tools we're using to inform our teaching practice, but a part of the way we encourage students to deepen their engagement with objects and the collection as a whole. Um, thank you, and I look forward to hearing suggestions and questions later.